In section 7.5, we investigate the factors that determine the strength of ionic and covalent bonds. First of all, we're going to begin by looking at the strength of covalent bonds. So the bond order of a covalent bond um, is determined by the number of electron pairs being shared. And in particular, we say that our bond has bond order 1 if it is a single bond when two electrons are being shared. We say that it has a bond order of 2 for a double bond when four electrons are being shared and a bond order of 3 for a triple bond where six electrons are being shared. For a given pair of atoms, the higher the bond order, the shorter the bond. And so we're looking at some uh, carbon to carbon and some carbon to nitrogen um, bonds here. And you can see that in every case, the um, bond gets longer as we go from triple to double to single. And again, for the carbon to nitrogen bond, triple, double, single. Uh, in your book, it's table 7.3. They have a big long list of bond lengths um, if you need that for any of your homework problems. Similarly, the energy required to break a bond, or another way of looking at that is the energy that is released when the bond is formed, increases with the bond order. So again, we've got a series of, um, we've got carbon to carbon bonds here and carbon to nitrogen bonds. And you can see that the um, bond energy is greatest for the triple bond, second greatest for the double bond, and least for the single bond. And that applies for um, both of the pairs of atoms there. And in your book, there's a table with a whole bunch of bond energies in it as well. So um, what is the bond strength or the bond energy? Well, what it is is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of bonds is broken, and this is um, determined in the gas phase. So if I break a mole of carbon, hydrogen, single bonds, the enthalpy change accompanying that process is just what the um, bond energy refers to. So something to keep in mind is that when bonds are formed, it's always an energy releasing process. It's always exothermic, that is delta H negative. And when bonds are broken, you, it's always a process where you have to put energy in, that is it's an endothermic process, i.e. delta H positive. So how do we use this information that's contained in these tables of bond energies? Well, if we consider a reaction such as the combustion of methane, where we have one mole of methane reacts with two moles of oxygen to form um, one mole of CO2 and two moles of um, water, a question might be, what is the enthalpy of that reaction? So we can consider this reaction as occurring via two steps. In the first step, what we're going to do is we're going to break all of the covalent bonds that are present in our reactants. So for us, the reactants are methane and oxygen. We have one mole of methane, so there are four carbon to hydrogen single bonds. And we have two moles of oxygen, and we've got a correct uh, Lewis diagram here for oxygen. So we have in our two moles of O2, two moles of oxygen to oxygen double bonds. So I can calculate the energy for breaking all of those bonds to give me the individual atoms that are present in my reactants. What I'm then going to do in my second step is I'm going to reconnect those atoms, but this time in the form of the products. So I'm going to join one carbon atom to two oxygen atoms via double bonds to form my, um, my CO2. And then I'm going to make two water molecules by taking the two oxygen atoms, and each of them are going to be bound by single bonds to two hydrogen atoms. So the enthalpy change for my overall process will simply be the, enthalpy, the sum of the enthalpy changes for each of these two steps. So in the first step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add together the bond energies for every bond that I'm breaking. And then in my second step, I'm going to add together the bond energies, the negative of the bond energies for every bond that I'm forming. Now I can just put the minus at the front there. So that just becomes like so. So my overall reaction is just step one plus step two. So I'm just going to take that and then I'm going to add it to that, and I'm going to get my enthalpy change for the overall process. So how can I use bond energies? 
or well, one way of using them is this. I can get the enthalpy of any reaction by summing together the bonds that will be broken from in the reactants and then subtracting from that the energy of the bonds that will be formed in the products. So this is kind of cool. Now it's going to be for the gas phase and not every reaction is in the gas phase, but this could be a good approximation for the enthalpy of many reactions. So now we can use tables of bond energies to determine the enthalpy of a reaction for you know a whole bunch of reactions. All we have to remember is that the enthalpy change of the reaction is just the sum of all of the bond energies for the bonds that are being broken in the reactants. And then we subtract from that the sum of all of the bond energies for the bonds that are forming in the products. So it's just reactants minus products. Um, something that's really important is I have to keep track of the number and type of each bond being broken. So here I'm just adding together the uh, bonds that are being broken amongst my reactants. So I've got one, two, three, four carbon to hydrogen single bonds. I look the value up for that in the table. It's 413 kilojoules per mole and I've got four of them. And then I have to add to that, I'm breaking two oxygen to oxygen double bonds. So I've got two um, bonds being broken and they each have an energy according to the table of 495 kilojoules per mole. So I add all of those together and I'm halfway through my problem, 2642 kilojoules. Now I have to do the same for my products. So my products in this case are the CO2 and the two water molecules. So I've got two moles of carbon to oxygen bonds, that's what's there. And then I've got one, two, three, four moles of, so four, four moles of oxygen to hydrogen single bonds. And I add all of those together and I get the sum of all of the bond energies of those um, bonds that are forming. So then to get my enthalpy change from my reaction, it's the sum of the um, bond energies of all the bonds that I'm breaking minus the sum of the bond energies of all of the bonds that I'm forming. And this reaction looks like it's exothermic and that's a good thing because when I burn methane in oxygen to create CO2 and water vapor, a whole bunch of heat is released, right? This is what's happening in the Bunsen burner. So we definitely expect that this is strongly exothermic. So that's an example of how we can use the bond energies of covalent bonds to determine the enthalpy of a chemical reaction. Now we're going to kind of consider the energy of the interaction of, um, that we find in um, ionic bonds, what we call the ion-ion interaction. And the ion-ion um, interaction, the bond energy um, of these ionic bonds is described by what we call the lattice energy. Sometimes this is given the symbol delta U lattice. And sometimes it's delta H lattice, you see both. And it's given by this little formula here. It says delta H lattice is equal to a constant multiplied by the product of the charges of the ions. Now we're only ever going to be looking at the interaction between two ions. So even if we have something like this, Na2O, where our ionic compound um, has three ions per formula unit, we're just interested in the interaction between one ion, one cation and one anion. That's what we're getting from the lattice energy. So we do want to keep that sort of, that's what, that's what those charges refer to. We don't have to do any multipliers there to account for the number of ions that are present. The distance between the ions is this term here, and it's the sum of the ionic radii. So if we were doing sodium ions and oxide ions, again, there's no multiplier to reflect that we have more than one sodium ion. So you just kind of keep that in mind. All right, so what it's really, 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 really saying is that um, big charges, big charges, you get strong bonds. Large radii give you weak bonds. The charge is almost always the dominant characteristic. 
Okay, so this lattice energy, what does it describe? It describes the energy change when a mole of an ionic compound is formed from the gas phase ions. So it's the enthalpy change for this process. Now it turns out that it's really hard to um, measure the lattice energy directly and it's often done by indirect methods. So um, let's just kind of um, talk about that a little bit more. So lattice energies are often difficult to measure and they're often determined indirectly. So if we think about the formation of sodium chloride from its elements, and we're going to be looking at the formation of one mole of sodium chloride here. So when we form one mole of a substance from its elements, the enthalpy change accompanying that process is referred to as the enthalpy of formation. The formation of sodium chloride is very, very exothermic. I'm just going to show you a little video. Um, on what that might look like. So let's see if we can get that up now. And I'm going to kind of uh, play it at, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to play this at two times so we can kind of cut to the chase. So there's a glass cylinder and it's full of um, chlorine gas there. The chlorine gas has a little kind of um, yellowish tinge to it. It's got a bit of sand in the bottom here to absorb some of the heat. And then now what we're doing is we're taking some um, sodium and the sodium is stored in hexane because it reacts with water in the atmosphere and then the or it's it's sorry it's stored in paraffin oil and then we're going to wash it in hexane and the reason it's stored in paraffin oil is to stop it um, reacting um, with water in the atmosphere now the um, hexane is being um, burnt off and you'll see a kind of a like a a characteristic glow of sodium there okay so the sodium is getting nice and hot we put it into the chlorine and it instantly reacts and it gives this bright yellow color which is characteristic of the emission spectrum of sodium and what you can see forming here is um, it looks kind of like a slightly dirty color here but that's just because of the yellow and um, that's light that's being emitted it's actually pure white and um, sodium uh, chloride and so when this all settles down, there's actually like going to be all white powder on the um, edges there. But there's one that Laurie, um, he's the lab tech from UC Berkeley, made earlier. And um, yeah, it looks like salt. And we've done this reaction and um, it works pretty well. So back to the PowerPoint. So we saw there that lots of heat was released, that this was an exothermic reaction. And you can see it would be very difficult to measure um, this um, lattice energy directly because, you know, they're just the circumstances of what's happening in that reaction. It would be very awkward to measure the energy that's being transferred. So typically people will use something that we call a Born-Haber cycle to describe the formation of an ionic compound like sodium chloride. And in a Born-Haber cycle, we what we do is we have a bunch of bond breaking processes. And then we have a few bond making processes that when all added together, they give a description of um, the elements combining to form an ionic compound. So when I go around steps one, two, three, four, five, I end up taking the elements, sodium and chlorine, and forming one mole of sodium chloride. And what you'll see here is that this last step here is the lattice energy. So this is a typical cycle that um, people will use to determine the lattice energy. And what we're gonna be relying upon is the fact that the enthalpy change for doing this in one step will be exactly the same as the enthalpy change for doing it via the five steps. So in the Born-Haber cycle, the formation of sodium chloride is described as occurring through five steps. There are a couple of steps which are um, bond breaking. That's going to be the first three. So we're taking sodium, and we're um, getting that into the gas phase, we're subliming it. So that's a bond breaking process, right? We're separating the sodium atoms from each other. We're then gonna take half a mole of chlorine gas 
and we're going to break the bonds between the chlorine molecules and we're going to form a mole of gas phase chlorine atoms. Again, that's a bond breaking process because we're breaking apart the single bond in the chlorine molecule. So in order to um, break apart half a mole of chlorine molecules, we're going to need one half of the bond energy for a chlorine to chlorine single bond. What we're going to do then is we are going to take our gas phase sodium atom and we're going to strip a single electron from it and form a gas phase sodium ion. So these first three steps here are bond breaking and as a result we would put, have to put energy in to make any one of those three occur. The next two steps are actually bond forming steps. First of all what we're going to do is we're going to take those chlorine atoms that we formed earlier on and we're going to bind an extra electron to it and that's going to give us a chloride anion. And so this process is describing um, what we call the electron affinity. The electron affinity one, in fact, is the energy released when we um, add one electron to an atom. And then the next thing that's going to happen is another bond forming process where the gas phase sodium ions that we made earlier on are going to conform, uh, going to combine with the gas phase chloride ions that we made right here. So when we do that, we form our solid sodium chloride and it's this fifth step here that we call the, the energy change for that fifth step is the lattice energy. So these two steps at the bottom here are bond forming. So if we just kind of look um, at our diagram, you see what I was talking about earlier about how people set up these Born-Haber cycles. On the left, I have one, two, three processes occurring, and you can see that they are all energy in. They're all the bond um, breaking processes. And then on the right, I've got listed out, and you can see these are all processes that release energy. These are all the bond forming processes. So bond formation over here, and breaking over here. But the important thing is when you add together those five steps, you take the elements and you combine them to form one mole of the ionic compound. So what do we know is that the heat of formation of sodium chloride will be equal to the sum of those five energies. So there it all is written out and I can look in tables and I can find the heat of formation of sodium chloride. It's minus 411.2 kilojoules per mole. So as I said, often it's difficult to get the lattice energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to reorganize this so that we can solve for the lattice energy. So I'm just going to subtract from the heat of formation, the heat of sublimation, one half of the chlorine to chlorine bond energy the ionization energy one of the sodium atom and the electron affinity one of the chlorine atom. And then I put all of that together and now I have an expression for the lattice energy. Now, this is not a generic expression for the lattice energy. It only works for sodium chloride. You will have a different expression if you have a different um, ratio of anions. So if you have something like that, you're gonna have a different expression. If you have something like this, where you've got a 1 to 2 ratio of cations and anions, you'll have a different expression again. So I can find the values that I need that are going to allow me to go ahead and calculate the lattice energy. And when I do that, I should always get a very big negative number for the lattice energy because this is a bond forming process so it should be negative and you know it's it tends to be a large release of energy as you saw in the demonstration forming sodium chloride a lot of energy gets released so this looks about right okay so here's a more elaborate example where you'll see that you can't um, just use a generic formula to solve for these things you need to think about the processes that are occurring so it says calculate the lattice energy for 
calcium fluoride and sodium fluoride using the following information. Which do you predict would have the greatest solubility in water? So it looks like here's a bunch of information for sodium fluoride and here's a bunch of information for calcium fluoride. So what we're going to do is we're going to work through and do a lattice energy calculation for each of these two compounds and then think about how that um, is going to affect their solubility in water. So here I am going through the sodium fluoride example. So to make sodium fluoride, I would take a mole of sodium, which is a solid at room temperature, and react it with half a mole of fluorine, which is a gas at room temperature, to give one mole of sodium fluoride. So I begin with the element sodium and a uh, one mole of sodium and half a mole of fluorine. The first thing I'm going to do is put some energy in and turn my solid state sodium into gas phase sodium. I'm not doing anything to the fluorine at this point. The energy that I need to do that is called the enthalpy of sublimation of sodium. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my half a mole of fluorine molecules. They are connected via a single um, bond, those two fluorine atoms. And I'm going to break all of the bonds in my half a mole of fluorine molecules to give me individual fluorine atoms. And the energy that I have to put in to do that will be one half of the fluorine to fluorine single bond energy. So now I have gas phase sodium atoms and gas phase fluorine atoms. I've only got one more bond breaking process to do. I have to take my sodium atoms and I've got to remove one electron from them to give me sodium ions in the gas phase. The fluorine atoms I'm leaving alone. So the energy required to remove a mole of electrons from a mole of gas phase sodium atoms is referred to as ionization energy one. So that's all of my um, all of my bond breaking processes listed out there on the left. What I've got to do now is list out all of my bond forming processes on the right. And these are going to be things that release energy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add an electron to my fluorine atom. So I'm just going to add one electron to each fluorine atom. So the energy required to do that is called the electron affinity one. And now I have a mole of gas phase um, sodium ions and a mole of gas phase fluoride ions and they're going to come together releasing a bunch of energy which is called the lattice energy and form my solid sodium fluoride. So as I go around these one, two, three, four, five steps to form my sodium fluoride, here they all are here, the energy change will just be exactly the same as if I went in one step down here. So what that means is that when I add together these five energies that that will be equal to the enthalpy of formation of sodium fluoride. So now, okay, I figured out what I got to add together and normally there's a half or something along the way that I have to factor in. I now reorganize this and solve for the lattice energy. So there it is, I've reorganized it to solve for the lattice energy. And I do the math, and for sodium fluoride, the lattice energy is minus, two, uh, minus 928 kilojoules per mole. So now I do the whole same thing for calcium fluoride. On the left, I've got bond breaking. On the right, I've got bond forming. So if I go in one step from calcium um, and fluorine to calcium fluoride, the energy change would be the enthalpy of formation of calcium fluoride. But now I'm going to go around in two uh, in individual steps do the and do the Born-Haber cycle. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my mole of ca solid calcium and I'm going to sublime it so I end up with a mole of gaseous calcium atoms. I'm not going to do anything to my fluorine. I'm then going to take my fluorine molecules and I have a whole mole of them this time and I'm going to separate them into individual atoms. So the energy required to do that will be the bond energy for a calcium uh, for a fluorine to fluorine um, single bond. 
So you see here that I've got a whole mole of um, fluorine in, um, in this case, not just half a mole of fluorine like I had previously. So once I've got my individual calcium and fluorine atoms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove two electrons from my calcium because calcium is in group 2A and forms a 2 plus ion. And so the energy that I have to put in to do that is the sum of two terms. It's going to be the ionization energy 1 plus the ionization energy 2 because I need to remove two electrons. So again, it's a little bit of a different scenario from what we had um, for the sodium fluoride. So we've got two of these guys. So now I've got a calcium 2 plus ion in the gas phase and I've got two moles of individual fluorine atoms. At this point, I'm going to start doing my bond forming reaction. So I hop on over and form another column on the right here. The first thing I'm going to do is to this two moles of fluorine atoms, to each of the uh, molar fluorine atoms, I'm going to add an electron. So adding an, um, one mole of electrons to a mole of fluorine atoms would be the electron affinity, but I'm going to do that twice. So the energy change involved in this process is two times the electron affinity. Okay, so now I'm kind of in business. I'm almost there. When my, I've got my gas phase calcium ions, I've got my gas phase fluoride ions, and they're going to snap together because positives attract negatives and form my solid calcium fluoride. And the energy that will be released is called the lattice energy. So if I go in one step, the energy that would be released is the enthalpy of formation for calcium fluoride. If I go around the Born-Haber cycle, the energy that would be released is the sum of all of these terms. So if I reorganize um, this expression that I've got here and uh, to isolate the lattice energy, then I can see how I can go ahead and calculate the lattice energy for calcium fluoride. And it ends up being a really big negative number. So let's compare that with what we had for sodium fluoride. So um, the lattice energy for calcium fluoride is a lot bigger than what it is for sodium fluoride. And that kind of makes sense because calcium ions are 2 plus, fluoride ions are 1 minus, sodium ions are only a single plus, fluoride ions still again 1 minus. So we would expect a lot stronger attraction between these guys than between these guys on the basis of charge. So because it's really hard to separate calcium ions from fluoride ions compared to um, sodium ions from fluoride ions, we would expect that calcium fluoride would be a lot less soluble in water than sodium fluoride. And that's true. Calcium fluoride is, you know, really, really not very soluble at all in water, whereas you get some pretty decent solubility for sodium fluoride. So, you know, you could have answered this question with a pretty large degree of certainty just by thinking about the charges of the ions. And to be honest, many of the problems that you're going to be encountering, you won't need to go through the Born-Haber cycle to decide on the properties of your ionic compound. You're just going to be looking at the charges and the sizes of your ions. So that concludes this section on the strengths of ionic and covalent bonds. And if you have any questions, please um, just reach out to me and I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, good luck with everything. Bye.